This is Studio One at CBS. Well, what's wrong with a place like Laburnum Grove, young lady? Just everything, Father. We're all so, so smug and settled down and dull. But why not? We've got a nice peaceful home and... And chickens and radios. <laughs> what do you want us to have? Elephants and tigers and racetracks? <laughs> CBS invites you to Studio One, where tonight we offer another full-hour broadcast in Columbia's feature series of versions for listening of celebrated stories, novels, and plays. We introduce the director of Studio One, Fletcher Markle. Our story tonight is a cheerful and deceptively uneventful item from the busy typewriter of Mr. J.B. Priestley, and it's called Laburnum Grove. As you may have guessed from our opening scene, Laburnum Grove is in a mood of smiling irony. However, Mr. Priestley's tongue is not always in his cheek. Now and then you find him sticking it right out at you like a rather rude small boy. As for our principal players tonight, you'll be hearing Everett Sloan as George Radfern with Anne Burr as his daughter Elsie and Lou Merrill, a visiting player in Studio One, as Bernie Baxley. If there's a world capital for tranquility, it's Laburnum Grove. Two acres of Connecticut charm, so named by George Radfern, who has made a home there for his wife and daughter. If there's any time of the week that's more tranquil than another, it's right now, which is Sunday morning. If there's anybody more contented than George Radfern with the life at Laburnum Grove, it might be his wife, Dorothy. About ready to go, Elsie? I am. And nobody could be more bored with it all than their daughter, Elsie. Yes, Mother. I've been ready for a half hour. I wish you'd go to church with me, dear. I'm meeting Harold at the station, remember? Well, why does he have to come out from town so early? He wants to talk to Daddy about something important. Oh, oh my little baby. Why, why didn't you tell your mother that you He wants it? to talk to Daddy about money. Oh, seems that everybody wants to talk to your father about money. Shh. I'm Clara and Uncle Bernie. You're just out on the sun porch. I don't care. Seems everybody's got the idea your father's made of money. Just a moment, dear. I'll get my gloves and we'll be ready to go. Mother? Yes? There's been a car parked out on the road all morning. The man in it seems to be watching our house. Nonsense, dear. Why should he be watching the house? I don't know, but it sure seems like it. Well, as soon as I say goodbye to your father, we'll be ready. By the way, where is your father? <laughs> where he always is. <laughs> out with his chickens. Well, we can wave to him as we go out. Oh, yes, I have to tell Aunt Clara about dinner. Uh, Clara! Out on the sun porch, Dorothy. I won't be here to fix dinner, dear. I'm having dinner with the Forbeses. Well, I'll take care of everything. The menu's on the kitchen table and... Well, good morning, Bernie. He's asleep. Oh. The chickens kept him awake again last night. Well, that's uh, too bad. Bet you can hardly wait until you get a place of your own. Away from the chickens, I mean. Yes. If only Bernie could find something worth his time. Well, we'll keep trying, won't we? Mm. You'll have one extra for dinner, you know, dear. Elsie's young man will be here. She's going to pick him up at the station. Bye. Goodbye, dear. Bernie. Bernie, wake up. Hmm? 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 What's the matter? Elsie's boyfriend, Harold, is coming out from New York today. Well, I don't have to get all dressed up when I come to him, do I? Well, I'm sure he's going to try to borrow money from George. Huh. He looks the type. Wake up, don't you see? You'll have to talk to George about our loan right away before that sponge on Harold gets to him. Huh? Oh, yeah, I get it. Uh, I'll go right away. Well, wait till the car's out of the drive. Huh? If Dorothy saw you going out to the chicken yard, she'd think you was trying to flim-flam her precious George and probably wouldn't go. All right. As soon as they go, then. That's better. All right, dear. Back up just a little more and you're on the drive again. Mother, there's the man Look I said where was you're watching. going, dear. Huh? What did you say? That man, the one I said was watching our house. 
He's out of his car and coming this way. Well, then stop, dear. Maybe he wants to ask us something. Mother, we ought to be careful. We don't know who he is. Oh, silly. It's broad daylight and Sunday, too. <clears throat> uh, were you looking for someone? Uh, yes, ma'am. I was in a way. Do you know Mr. Joseph Fletton? Joe Fletton, of course. But you have the wrong house. He lives down the road about a quarter of a mile. Uh, do you know anything about him? Well, I don't, but he and my husband both raise chickens, and they see each other quite often. What do you want to know about him? Uh, I, I wondered how he earns his living. Well, I suppose he sells eggs and some chickens. Doesn't he travel quite a lot? Yes, I believe he does. Hmm? Do you know why? Well, I... I imagine to sell his eggs and chickens. I see. Hey, is your husband around? Oh, yes, with his chickens. Well, I may drop in to see him one of these days. About Mr. Fletton? Um, about various things. I'll tell him. Oh, uh, who shall I say? Uh... The name is Stack. See you later. Oh, yes. Yes, goodbye. Now, what do you suppose that is? Do you suppose Mr. Fletton's in some sort of trouble? <laughs> He's going to hurt you. Chick, 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 chick. Eh? We've got to see what's the trouble with you, don't we? Uh, George. Uh, there we are. No, it isn't so bad. We're friends, aren't we? Uh, George. Now, let's have a little look at you. Uh, how's every little thing, George? Steady there now, old girl. Not so good, Bernie. Not so good, huh? Chickens like you this morning, too? Bernie, I think I have coccidiosis. Huh? What's that? Disease. Disease? Uh, bad. Bad as they come. You mean maybe fatal? Nine cases out of ten. Oh, George, George, that, 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 that's, that's awful. Plum awful. Does, does Dorothy know about it? No, just found it out. Oh, you poor guy. Well, Chick, I guess you're all right. Where you go now? Well, I guess now is the time to talk with you about a thing. Huh? Guess you started doing a little worrying about how Dorothy and Elsie are going to get along then, aren't you? No, oh, they aren't much interested. No, I know that ain't true at all. Never saw any two people so darn fond of anybody as them two are of you. Say, what's eating you, Bernie? Oh, I know you're just now getting over the shock of it, George, but but it ain't too soon to start thinking about what's going to happen to them. Yeah. Hey, hey, where are you going? Well, if you want to talk to me, come on. I'm going to the feed house. Somebody's going to have to look after things, you know. Uh, a man. Now, I don't know how well off you're going to leave him, but it'll take managing. All right, come on in if you're coming in. Can't leave the door open or the chickens will come right in the feed house and start eating out of the bins. Uh, and uh, close the door after uh, you. Oh, yeah. Now, I guess it's lucky for you that Claire and me are here with you in this hour of need. Eh? Uh, well, that's an interesting way of looking at it, I suppose. Yes, sir. Like I said, I don't know how well fixed you're leaving Dorothy and the girl, but no matter how much it is, things can happen. And it would be comforting for you to know that they got somebody, somebody of their own, that'll look after them. <laughs> you know what I'm driving at? Frankly, no. Well, look. I've had a couple of propositions. Good opportunities, see, but they require capital. Uh, you follow me? Like a panther. Say, you're sitting on my new trap nest. They bend. Oh, sorry. Now, if you could let me have a little money, George, I could buy into these here propositions. Uh, how little money? Oh, 1500 2000 That's quite a lot of money. Well, think of what you're buying for Dorothy and Elsie, though. Why, it's like a life insurance policy of... Oh, 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 excuse me for mentioning life insurance at a time like this. Oh, it's all right. And there's always the problem of how the loved ones get along before the estate is settled. Well, if I got to go in business, you don't have about to worry about that. Claire and me take care of them. You know that. Yeah, it must be that new disinfectant's no good. Are you listening to me, George? Yeah, uh, kind of. Well, what do you say? About what? How about the loan? Oh, oh, well, I'd have to think that over for a while, Bernie. Fifteen hundred's a lot of money. Well, maybe it ought to be two thousand, considering the circumstances. Yeah, well, I'd have to think that over a lot longer. But how long do you have? For what? 
Oh, I know you don't feel much like talking about it, but roughly how long you got? How long have I got for what? I mean, how much longer can you hold on? To what? Your life, of course. Well, I'm 53 now. I guess I have another 25 or 30 years in me. 25 or 30... But what about the coccidy hooses, the, the, the disease? Well, I'll lose maybe 20 chickens or so, but that isn't going to kill me. You mean, you mean it's the chickens that has the coccidy, the disease? Well, sure. I don't think humans get it. But you better close your mouth in case there are germs in the air, Bernie. I'm glad to hear it, George, and that you ain't got the fatal disease, I mean, but, you know... We'll think about the loan, won't you? Yeah, it must be the disinfectant. What, Bernie? Uh, oh, oh, the loan. Yeah. Yeah, I'll think about it. Here's the car, Harold, right here. You want to drive? Yeah, yeah, I'll drive. You did say your dad was home today, didn't you? Oh, no, you get in first. You don't have to go around. Mm. Sure, he's spending this Sunday as he does all his Sundays with his chickens. Hope he's in a accepted mood. Oh, Harold, I'm so glad you could come out from town today. I've been so bored all week. You don't know how awful it is. Was he cheerful at breakfast? Who? Oh, Daddy. Uh. Of course, he's always cheerful. Mm. You have no idea how dull it can be in the country. Oh, I know it's healthful and all of that, but nothing, absolutely nothing ever happens. <laughs> Things are sure lively in the used car business, though. I'm losing a lot of sales today, but in the long run, it may pay off. Hey, baby? What? Oh, yeah, I hope so. Uh, you like living in the city, don't you, Harold? Mm-hmm. I would, too. I just know it. Something going on all the time, excitement. People all dressed up and doing things. Ah, you get used to it. Harold, you've never talked about it, but you wouldn't like living in the country, would you? I don't think so. Oh, I'm glad. You simply can't realize how dull it is. Doubt if you could sell many used cars out here. People have too much dough. They want new cars if they can afford them. I wonder if Mother knew Daddy wanted to live out ten miles from nowhere before she married him. I don't know. How's the paper business? What, Harold? It ought to be booming. Bet your old man's bringing it home by the satchel full. I don't think I understand what you're saying, Harold. I'm talking about your father's business. He's in wholesale paper, isn't he? Well, yes, but... Well, he's probably doing so well that he won't miss a few thousand. Oh, I see. You, um, you were going to talk with him about us, weren't you? Us? Oh, sure, sure. I'll put it to him straight. A guy has to be in business for himself if he wants to make a killing these days. And you've had things pretty easy. He wouldn't want you to have to live in some cold water walk-up. Cold water walk-up in New York. Golly, something to do all the time. We won't get dull and stuffy, will we, Harold? You bet not, honey. I'm going to make a pot full of dough. I don't mean Daddy is dull and stuffy. He's just, well, just quiet and... Well, contented with his chickens and conservative, you know? Yeah, yeah, he probably does real well in wholesale paper these days. Harold? Hmm? You know, you haven't said you love me yet today. Why, honey, everything I do and say when I'm with you ought to tell you that. There's nothing like Sunday dinner, huh? Nice ham, Mr. Radford. Yeah. Not quite as good as last Sunday, but better than the one the Sunday before last and the Sunday before that. Uh, will you pass me the broccoli, Clara? Here you are, George. You see, Harold, how routine life is here at Laburnum Grove? Never have to guess what you're having for Sunday dinner, you always know. And Monday dinner and Tuesday dinner. Well, if you tell your mother, she'll have roast beef on Sundays for a while. Then what would we have on Thursdays? I'll have a little more ham myself, Clara. Did you ever think that eating too much at times might be causing you to lose your sleep, Bernie? Hmm? No, you know what's wrong with my sleeping, them blame chickens. Mm. Uh, uh, how's the uh, 
Wholesale paper business these days, Mr. Radford. Mm -hmm. Pretty good, I'd imagine. Salt. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, sir, the, uh, the used car business is really jumping these days. It won't last. Oh, I don't know about that. People always buy used cars. Of course, we have good times now. They're willing to pay. But when times aren't so good, more people will have to buy used cars. See my reasoning? Mm -hmm. I remember in the 30s in Dallas, used car dealers couldn't give them away. Uh, well, uh, a guy who's set up right these days could make enough to be retired before times like that come back. Applesauce? No, oh, really, it's true. Daddy wants you to pass him the applesauce. Well, it... Oh, oh, yeah, sure. Sure, here you are. You know, the, the other day a fella drove in with a brand new Buick. Listed around 2900 He'd only driven it 50 miles. You know how much he wanted for it? No, only 3500 I bought it for the company, of course, but if I'd had money of my own, boy. He means he could have sold it at a profit. Profit? I could have got at least 5000 for it. If you ask me, that isn't exactly honest. Not honest? Listen, it's worth it to the guy who buys it, else he wouldn't pay that much. Oh, I know. That's free enterprise, but... supply and demand. Right, Mr. Redfern? Yeah, it depends on how you look at it. Uh, you see? Well, I wouldn't pay $5,000 for a $2,900 car used. People are doing it every day. Well, I wouldn't. Anybody ready for their coffee now? Oh, Not I yet. Oh, yes, Clara. That'd be a pleasant diversion. <laughs> That's the door. I'll get it. Yeah, yeah. That's the three. Year with my own setup and the used car ra uh, used car business, and I'd be able to buy a place in the country like this. Oh, Harold, you wouldn't. Well, I, I just mean. Uh, that. What's I wrong with a place like this, young lady? Everything, just everything. Everybody's so so smug and settled down and dull. Well, why shouldn't they be? They've got nice peaceful homes and and uh... chickens and radios. <laughs> What do you want us to have? Elephants and tigers and racetracks? But it's all so, so... so... Suburban. Yes, suburban. Well, that's all right with me. When your mother and I came out here to Connecticut, we we just thought we'd got somewhere. That's why we're so pleased with ourselves and ready to live a nice, quiet life. George! Mr. Blanton at the door. He says he has to see you about something urgent. Urgent? Well, uh, ask him if it'll wait until I finish dinner. All right. You know, I see what else he means. Now, down in Dallas, there's a lot going on all the time. Uh, you're missing a lot then, Bernie, mm -hmm. staying here so long. Yeah, well, uh, business opportunities don't seem to be there for me right now. And... He says it's pretty important, George, about his chicken. Well, tell him I'll come over to see him after dinner. There. You'll see? see Excitement. Mr. Flatton can't wait a minute. Is somebody being murdered? Is a house burning down? No. It's his chickens. Now, Elsie. Unless it could be about the man who was looking for him. Hmm? Man looking for him? Mm, this morning. Was sitting in a car parked out on the road watching our house. When I took Mother to church, he came over to us and started asking questions about Joe Flatton. Uh, what sort of questions? Oh, about what he does for a living and where he goes. I see. But it's probably nothing. <laughs> he probably bought something on time and didn't make his payments and skipped. There's nothing exciting ever happens around here. You know, Elsie, there are men who have worked hard all their lives so they could settle down in a place like this. And there's no telling what they've risked, some of them. That's the nice thing about the used car thing now. No risk. Ha! Huh. Uh, I beg your pardon? No, I'm on the trail of something that there's really no risk to. And real money in it. Big money. I'm talking about legitimate business. Uh, George, I don't know why you let people like that Joe Fletton come around here. He don't have the least bit of tone. Oh, Joe's all right. Now, what was I saying? Oh, yes, yes, yes. You see... These are the times a young guy like me can pick up a nice piece of change in a short time. And honestly, there are other ways, you know. Don't I know it. The times I've turned down fortunes because the deals involve shady money. Yeah, same here. I want to get along, sure. But I want to stay on the straight and narrow. Yes, indeed. Well, I'm glad to hear that you feel that way, all of you. You know, uh, I used to think like that in the old days... Oh, I'll have another slice of ham, please, Clara. What do you mean, Daddy? In the old days? 
Oh, I mean in the days when I used to be in the wholesale paper trade. But you're still in the wholesale paper trade, George. That's so, Bernie? How do you know I am? Why, why I always thought you was. <laughs> well, I'm not. Huh? Haven't been for several years. But you go to the office every day. Oh, sure. I have to keep that office going. It's just a blind. Uh, pass the mustard, will you, Elsie? Uh-huh. Uh, blind, Mr. Radford? Mm-hmm. Thank you, my dear. But, Daddy, does does Mother know you're not in the paper business? No. And I don't want any of you to tell her. She's a little old-fashioned. You can ask me what you like, and I'll answer truthfully, but... Uh, not a word to her. Promise? Sure, oh, we yes, promise. Yes, that's what you want, of course. Yes, I gave honesty a fair chance, and it didn't work, so I thought I'd try the other thing. The other thing? Mm-hmm. A little more of that broccoli, please. Daddy, you don't mean dishonesty, do you? Truth be told, I suppose it has to be called that. You're kidding. Oh, Daddy, that's ridiculous. Well, you talk as if you were a crook. Well, I am a crook. A crook? Hey, now look here. Oh, you... I don't like the term, but it fits. Criminal sounds better. Enemy of society. That's better yet. George Rampton, you don't look like a crook to me. Uh, did you forget about the coffee clown? Oh, so I did. Yes, that's what I am, though. <laughs> Maybe that answers why Joe Fletton comes here. I knew it. That Joe Flatten is a crook. Why, sure. He works for the organization. Organization? Very old hand. Say, what's the matter? Am I the only one eating? Daddy, do you really mean all this? Why, of course I mean it. Every penny that's come into this house the last few years has been dishonestly earned. Great God. Well, it was all that was left to me when the big paper companies froze me out. It's dangerous, of course. Is it dangerous? One slip, and that's all. But but what do you do? Well, you might describe it as a private policy of inflation. We make money. Yes, but how? Well, that's it. We make money. Print it. <laughs> it's against the law, you know. Counterfeiting? Oh, yes, very much against the law. The United States Mint doesn't like competition. They don't agree with you about free enterprise in their field, Harold. Well, I think we're all ready for our dessert, Clara. Oh, the dessert. Well, I, uh, I, I think I'll have to be going. Oh, so soon? Yeah, yeah. Well, Elsie was telling me you might have something to talk over with me. Oh, that. Well, some other time. Uh, will you drive me to the station, Elsie, or shall I walk? Oh, I, uh, I'll take you. Oh, good oh heavens, well, that's, that's, that's the door. Why, well, that could be the law. Yeah. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> but it probably isn't. Not this time. But sooner or later. Well, if nobody wants to finish the applesauce, I will. <laughs> Well, don't suppose you know what time the next train for New York is due, hmm? In a few minutes. The local. Oh. Well. Well. I I'll be seeing you. Yes, it's Thursday. We're going swimming at Todd's Point, isn't it? Oh, well, I, uh, I, I, I forgot about that. Something's come up. I, I won't be able to get away Thursday. Friday, then? I'd, uh, better call you, Elsie. All right. Well, your, your mother's waiting for you to pick her up. You don't have to wait with me. You can go on. See you. Uh-huh. See you. Well, this really takes the cake. Ha! Huh. You all the time blowing off about what high-class relations you have. Talking about how mine are just cowpokes and drill men. Oh, shut up. It isn't my sister who's the crook. It's him. And he's an in-law. You called my Uncle Lenny a cattle thief. Huh? 
He taught you how to change brands. He was no counterfeiter. You're going to have to pack your own bag. I'm not doing it for you. Uh-huh. A lot of crush they had. And all them hints they throwed out about us sponging off them too long. Huh? Will you quit saying hi? No, Dad, Bird, I won't. You better be careful how you fold your suits now to put in the bag. You're out of press enough as it is. Yeah. I ought to send them out to the cleaners and put it on their bill. <laughs> the other bag is in the cellar. You better go down and get it. Well? We oughtn't to spend another night under this roof. Oh. Aren't we? With a crook? Yeah, just what I say. But I doubt if we could get a room in New York on a weekend night like this. Well, if you want to stay. I don't want to stay. Well, if you do, I could put up with it, I suppose. We could stay up here in our room. Oh, how I'd love to tell that high and mighty sister of mine about this. We did promise, though, you know, Clara. She'll get the idea. I'll let her know we're leaving because we've got some regard for the kind of people we associate with. But it won't come right out with it. Oh, I'd love to be here when the law shows up to arrest him. Him and his chickens. Bernie, hmm? how much money do you have? Uh, a little better than $80. Is that all you got left out of the 200 you borrowed from him last week? When you're trying to get a fellow to offer you a big proposition, you can't act like you're broke now, can no, you? No, you can't. You had to be the big oil millionaire from Dallas, I guess. I don't have no relatives that are cross. Oh, shut up! You don't think I ought to hit George for another couple hundred before we go, do you, Clara? Well, of course not. No, indeed. Bernie, hmm? he probably doesn't use any of the counterfeit money himself, though. Oh, of course not. Obviously, when he goes on these business trips, he gets it changed into real money. Bernie Baxley, what are you thinking of? I wasn't thinking of anything. You was the one that had the ideas, you and your crooked relation. He's not a blood relation. <laughs> Everybody. On the sun porch, darling. My, but it's nice to be back home. Do you realize it's cooler here than any place in Fairfield County? The Forbes' place was just sweltering. There's my darling. You missed a good ham, dear. I missed you. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I was sorry as soon as I'd accepted her invitation. Then it was too late. Where's Elsie? Putting the car in the garage. She must have had a spat with Harold. I don't doubt that she did. Where are Clara and Bernie? Up in their room. Uh, they may act a little peeved when you see them. You didn't have a scene at dinner, did you? Quite a scene. Are they angry? Mm-hmm. Angry enough to leave? I think so. That's why I did it. What did you do? Oh, told them a little story. Well, what kind of a story? Nothing much, really. think it did the trick, though. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> I guess that's not nice for me to say that, but, well, truth to tell, I wouldn't be heartbroken if they decided to leave, and and I know you wouldn't be. Oh, I'd survive it. Uh, Elsie say anything to you? About her spat with Harold? No. Of course, that's what's wrong with her. She just raved on and on about how she'd wanted to get away from our laburnum grove because it was so dull. And so? Oh, she's changed her mind about that. She said she wished it was dull. What about you? Hmm? You think I'm dull? Oh, no, indeed. You know, darling, sometimes I do think you're a little too quiet and easygoing. Mrs. Forbes made a few snide remarks about it at dinner, but after seeing Mr. Forbes, well, if he's exciting, I much prefer my nice, honest, sleepy old you. <laughs> I thank you, my dear. <laughs> I thank you. Listening to Studio One at CBS, which tonight is presenting J.B. Priestley's play *Laburnum Grove*, as arranged for radio by Charles Guzman. Our story will resume after the usual brief pause for local station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
from Studio One at CBS, continuing Laburnum Grove by J.B. Priestley. The story of a quiet man in a quiet suburb who suddenly announced he lived another and dangerous kind of life. Morning, George. Well, funny. Good morning. You up for breakfast this morning? Uh, I did a lot of thinking last night, George. I'm glad to hear it. Thinking's good mental exercise, eh? Hmm? Oh, (laughs) yes. Shall we uh, go downstairs together? After you. Uh, See, you have a valise. Yes, I have a valise. I see you have. Hey, your pondering last night seems to have sharpened your mind. Going somewhere today, George? To Boston. On business. And I never heard of anybody going to Boston for pleasure. Then in that police, you must have... I do. <laughs> um, uh, talk to you a minute, George. Well, I'll have to hurry. I've got to catch a train. Oh, breakfast will be ready for you in the kitchen. Oh, Clara got up to fix it for you. Oh, very thoughtful of her. Uh, we're sorry about yesterday, George. And so? I told Clara, <clears throat> George has been good to us, Clara. It ain't right for us to go busting off when him and his little family might need us at any moment, no matter what he's done. And uh, what did Clara say? She agreed. She said, you're right, Bernie. Even if he's arrested, he won't tell the police that his sister-in-law and brother-in-law knew anything about, uh, about... It. And what did you say? I agreed. Yes, sir, George. What I said yesterday when I thought you was dying from that disease, it still goes. If the law hauls you off, there's got to be somebody to look after your little family. Uh, Bernie, if I'd set you up in that business before you learned my money was tainted, maybe you would have taken care of it. That's it. That's just it. I can still get in on that proposition if I had the $2,500. Wasn't the amount 1500 yesterday? Well, considering the circumstances... Oh, you mean it's no trouble to print another thousand? That's it. It's no... Oh, now, George, you wouldn't give me bad money anyhow, would you? Uh, I'd have to think about the whole proposition. I might change my mind. After all, there's a risk involved, and I... Yes, I'll consider that when I think it over. But, George, I... Now, my breakfast is ready, Bernie, and that train isn't going to wait for me. But, Georgie... Well, we were all up this morning, eh? Good morning, Daddy. I love you, Daddy, no matter what. Oh, here now. Daddy's a little frail to get such a squeezing as that. What sort of talk is that? You love him no matter what. Oh, I understand. Uh, Good morning, dear. Darling... Your breakfast is all ready to sit down to. I seem to have had some help from a surprising quarter. Yes, I see. Good morning, Clara. Morning, George. I've been stirring your coffee, so it ought to be cool for you, since you have to hurry. Oh, thank you. Well, you all look reasonably cheerful this morning. The heartbreak isn't so bad as it was yesterday, eh, Elsie? I want to be loved for myself, in spite of everything. Right. And that leaves out Harold, fortunately. Gracious, in spite of everything. Our girl certainly is in a mood today. Oh, well, you know, broken heart. Uh, I think there's nothing like a spending spree to soothe the wounded heart. Here's $20, Elsie. See if a nice new hat won't help you forget Harold. A brand new $20 bill? Oh, no. George, what's wrong with you? Why, you'd think that whole satchel of yours is full of money the way you throw it around. <coughs> Bernie. Uh, oh, I, uh, excuse me, the coffee was too hot. I know that. Go on with your dusting, dear. I'll see who it is. Let's get the housework done by noon. How do you do? Oh, hello. You're the gentleman I talked to yesterday about Mr. Fletcher. That's right. You're, uh, you're Mr. Stack, is that right? Yes, ma'am. I'm with the Treasury Department here in my credentials. Oh, treasury man. Well, won't you come in? Thank you. Yeah. Well, this is going to be another hot day. Yes, it's starting off that way. <laughs> 
Dear, I bet you want to see Mr. Radford, and I completely forgot to tell him that you might be dropping in, and he's not here. Oh? Did I miss him? He's gone up to Boston today on business, but he'll be back this evening. Boston? Yes. Yes, he has to travel quite a lot. He's in the wholesale paper business. Mm-hmm. Oh, dear. I, I hope he hasn't made a mistake in his income tax return. Is that what it is you're checking up on? I'm afraid I can't be much help if that's it. George is the moneymaker around here. Hmm? Oh, yes. No. No, it's not about income tax. Yeah, here's my card. Oh, your name is George, too. Mm-hmm. Why, you're with the Bureau of Secret Service. Yes, ma'am. How exciting. Well, won't George be thrilled when he knows a Secret Service man has come to see him? You know, you don't look a bit as I'd imagine Secret Service men would look. <laughs> I've heard that before. Is it something exciting, what you want to see my husband about? No, it's just a routine matter. Well, I'll, uh... Who was it, Mother? A secret service man. Oh, no! <laughs> see? See what excitement it is when a secret service man comes around? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> dear, dear, this is Mr. Uh, oh, he's still here. Mr. I... Stack, my daughter, Elsie. Uh, how, how, how do you do? How do you oh, do? And uh, this is my sister and her husband. Oh, I'm glad to know you. My name's Baxley. Oh, it's a pleasure. Mine's Stack. He's a secret service man. He's what? Great God. Oh, look at them. <laughs> you think they were guilty of something? <laughs> well, I'm used to that. Well, I'd, I'd better be getting along. You say Mr. Radford will be back this evening? Yes, eight at the very latest. I'll tell him you'll be back. Uh, thank you. Well, that settles it, Clara. We're getting out of here right now. Indeed we are. Oh, Mother! Well, now, what is all this? I'll tell you what it is. All these years you've been so la di da and so too good for your sister, so high and mighty. Oh, Clara, really? You were so superior because George was so well off. Well, my Bernie could be well off, too, that way. What are you raving about? Oh, Mother, it's awful. It's what? just awful. Will somebody please tell me what this is all about? I'll tell you what. That big shot husband of yours is a crook. A cheap crook, and the law is on to him. You must all be out of your minds. No, it's true, Mother. It's all true. He t- 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 told us a story yesterday. He isn't in the paper business at all. Oh, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> he's a counterfeiter. He's a counterfeiter, and he's in an, an organization. <laughs> oh, he told you that, huh? and you believed. Oh, that's priceless. George, a counterfeiter. Co- 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 well, I don't see what's so dad name funny. <laughs> Isn't that just like Daddy? Teasing that way, and he fooled them. We, he kind of fooled me, too. Well, you didn't actual, actually believe your father was a criminal, did you? He told us about it, and he was so serious. He told us you didn't know about it, that we were supposed to keep it a secret from you. Well, of course, he knew he couldn't fool me with such nonsense. Well, oh. as for me, I... Well, this is serious. How do you mean? Well... You believed him, Clara. You, Bernard. I I think we can agree that you wouldn't want to stay here with us after this. He ought to be ashamed of himself, giving us a scare like this. You should be ashamed of yourselves, believing a story like that. But how could Daddy make up a story like that? Well, that's very simple, Elsie. You see this book on the table? It's called Shoving the Queer. It's about counterfeiting and counterfeiting gangs. So, you see... Well, Clara... I guess we better go up and finish packing. I love it, Mother. It's for me, anyway. It may be for me, you know. Your father might be calling from Boston to I say... I made a long-distance call. Here, let me have it. Look. Hello? Fairfield 9970? Yes. On your call to Mr. Harold Russ in New York. Yes? We have located Mr. Russ. One moment. Well, who is it, dear? I'm calling Harold. You're doing what? To tell him about Daddy. It's going to be all right. You're doing... Give me that phone. Mother, they're putting Harold on it. Do you mean to tell me that you would call him and beg him to come back after the way he left you yesterday? But he thought that Daddy How was... much could he love you if he'd throw you over like that? But even if it was true about Daddy... But how would he know? Hello? It doesn't make any difference. Hello? You want a boy who'd love you no matter what. Mother, he's on the phone. Where's your pride? Where's your pride, Elsie? He'll hear you. My hand is over the mouthpiece. Hello? But he's waiting. Well, he can wait a little longer. 
Hello, Harold. Hello. Hold on a minute, Harold. Oh, Mother. Oh, all right then. Talk to him. But don't tell him Father was just fooling. But... Get him to come out here. Tell him you want to settle things, but don't tell him Daddy was fooling. Oh, oh all right. Here. Hello, Harold. This is Elsie. Oh, hello. I want you to come out here this evening. As soon as possible, in fact. Well, I, uh... I, I don't think I can make it. Elsie. You will so make it. We have things to settle. Be here, do you understand? You be here. Well, all right. I'll meet the 632 at Stanford. Goodbye. That's the way to tell him. That's my girl. <laughs> my, my, how Daddy will laugh when he hears about all this. <laughs> Get the door. Well, you bring your bag when you come down. Hurry up. This is probably our cab. All right, honey. Mm. Oh, it's you. May I come in? Harold, my lad, you can come in or stay out. I do not give a hand. No, I think I'll come in. Elsie's expecting me. Right now, not right now, but she's expecting me. Came out early into the cab from Stanford. That's very interesting, but I do not give one darn hoop. Hmm. See, you're leaving. You darn tootin' we're leaving? I don't see how you stayed overnight after what he told us. Hmm? Oh, you don't believe that story he has, do you? Uh, story? That about him being a counterfeiter and criminal and all? It's true, isn't it? So he took you in, did he? <laughs> I didn't think he was dry behind the ears. You mean it isn't true? Heck no. He just knew you was going to put the bite on him for a loan, and you spouted off about how honest you are. Oh, I see. You know, you could still take him for a little dough. All you have to do I is... I think I heard the door. Did anybody see who it was? Hey, it's somebody for you, Elsie. For me? All you have to do... I know what to do. All right, I'll see you later. Hey, ain't you able to close that suitcase, Claire? Well, why don't you come and help me? Who is it? Oh... Oh, Harold. Elsie, honey. Oh, golly, if you hadn't called me, I'd have died. Really, I would. No, no, don't you put your arms around me. A baby, what's the matter? Honey, you don't know what a night I had. I had to tell you. I don't care what your father is or what he does. I love you. Oh, Harold. Oh, will you ever forgive me for the way I acted last night? I could, I guess. I acted without thinking. It was such a shock to me, I just... just didn't think, that's all. And then when I realized... Oh, Harold... Harold, I knew you really loved me. I just knew it. I was... Hey, who let you in? Your Uncle Bernie. Did he say anything? Uh, say anything? About what? Mm, nothing. I just wondered. Oh, honey, just think I almost lost you. Um, when's your father going to be home? I want to talk to him. Uh, about us. You mean you talk to him in of everything? Sure, he's the father of the girl I'm crazy about. Oh, are you really? You bet I am. Come on, Clara, our cab's pulling in the drive. Uh, Elsie, what time's he going to be home? I want to talk to him as soon as I can. He'll be in on the 722 from Boston. Well, I'll talk to him then. Oh, that'll be just... Oh, oh, I just remembered there's a secret service man coming around to see Daddy this evening. Well, if there's a secret service man coming around to see your father, perhaps I could see him for a few minutes afterwards when he says... Oh, What? Secret Service man with the Treasury Department. Coming to see your father? Yeah. Well, why should that make any difference? You can talk to him afterwards. Well, you're wrong. But you... Sorry, your old man and old lady aren't around to get our goodbye kisses. Yes. Terribly sorry. Yeah. Goodbye. Goodbye, Aunt Clara. Bye, Uncle Bernie. Hey. Hey, you two. Harold, where are you going? Hey, you, you mind if I show your cab? Wait for me. That was a dirty trick telling me that, Mr. Baxley. No, no, no. That could have landed me in trouble. Harold, you didn't mean what you said. Well, there's my girl. Oh, and I thought she'd be wearing a nice new hat to the station this evening. <laughs> Where's your smile? Hello, Daddy. The car's right over here. Now, now, what's this? You're not still mooning over that used car salesman, are you? Oh, Daddy, I know you didn't mean it to be, but that was a mean trick, telling that awful story. Story? I didn't know myself that you were just teasing. Not until Mother found out about it. Oh, uh, Mother found out about it, did she? Uh-huh. 
And she really told off Aunt Clara and Uncle Bernie. They're gone. Left this afternoon. And so did Harold. Well, there now, I don't think there's much lost in the lot. Hey, Mr. Radford. Mr. Radford. Oh, somebody's... Oh, it's Joe Flatton. What are you doing here, Joe? Oh, I was uh, kind of waiting for you, Mr. Radford. Well, fine. And you can ride out our way with us. Uh, scoot in, baby. You drive. Okay. It's, uh... It's kind of urgent, Mr. Radford. Well, we can talk about it as we go home. Hop in. <laughs> it's, uh... It's about the chickens, Mr. Radford. Trouble? Looks like it. Oh. And, uh, drive carefully, Elsie. We want to live even if you don't care so much about life yourself right now. The more I think of it, the surer I am I should be angry with you, Daddy. The trouble, uh... Hey, Mr. Radford? I hope not. You know what he did, Mr. Fletton? He told my aunt and uncle and my boyfriend... My former boyfriend that he was a crook. He did? And they believed him. At least my aunt and uncle did until Mother told him Daddy was just joking. Harold still does, I guess. Now, what do you think of that? Your daddy a crook. Now, that's a rich one. <laughs> now, Joe... Everything would have been all right with Harold if I hadn't mentioned the Secret Service man. The Secret who? I believe she said Secret Service man. What about a Secret Service man, Elsie? There's one coming to see you this evening. He came this morning. Mother told him he'd be back this evening. He was the man out front who asked about you, Mr. Flatton. Oh, uh, did he? My, uh, flock has coccidiosis, Joe. Uh, so, so is mine. Well, we mustn't lose our heads about it. Oh, looks like the Secret Service man is here already. I think that's his car in the drive. Right. Uh, meet you in the house, Elsie. I want to talk to Mr. Flett in a moment before I go in. I'll tell him you'll be right in, Daddy. Night, Mr. Flatton. Uh, good night, Miss Elsie. Uh... Hey, George. You're not going in there, are you? Well, I have to. You're walking right into it. I knew it was bad. That's why I wanted to see you. But I didn't know it was as bad as this. What did that Secret Service man say when he came to see you yesterday? Didn't nobody come to see me yesterday. All I know is that they knocked off our outfits in Philly and in Memphis. Well, they may not have a thing on us. But maybe they have. I ain't gonna hang around and take any chances. I ain't no coward, but... But I ain't no fool either. If you had any sense, you'd get away now while you can. No, no, Joe. I'm going to have to risk it. After all, Dorothy and the girl don't know. I'll... I'll have to go in and try to bluff it through. <laughs> Oh, Dorothy, I'm home. Be down in a minute. There's a gentleman to see you. Uh, yes, I see there is. Ah, how do you do? I'm George Radford. Now, my name is Stack. I'm with the Treasury Department. Oh, the Treasury Department. Well, please, please sit down. What can I do for the Treasury Department? Uh, are my credentials? Oh, I take your word for it. Well, Secret Service, eh? This is the first time I've had the pleasure of talking to anybody from the Secret Service. Well, the work isn't as exciting as most people think. Mostly routine, long hours and routine. Not many quiet evenings at home. <laughs> I don't think I'd like the life then. I like quiet evenings at home. Uh, you uh, wanted to see me about uh, something in particular? Yes, that's right. You're uh, in the wholesale paper business, aren't you? Oh, in a small way, yes. The big boys crowded me out, so I haven't been doing quite as much as I'd like. Is that... I wonder if you'd mind taking a look at this $10 bill for me. Yes? What about it? It isn't a real $10 bill, Mr. Redburn. It's counterfeit. Not really. Well, what do you know? You certainly could have fooled me with it. Would you examine the paper? I imagine you're an expert in judging papers. Well, thank you, but I don't... Oh, yes. Yes, I can see that the paper isn't quite right. Oh. Uh, the reason I've come to you, sir, is that we've traced the paper from the manufacturer. It seems to be from a lot that your company purchased about four years ago. Really? Making a routine check of the companies that 
got some of the lot. Oh, I see. Well, can I help you in some way? Yes, I wonder if you could tell me how your stock of that paper was disposed of. Well, now, I really couldn't say without looking at the records at the office. Is this very urgent? I, I mean, could it wait until tomorrow? I'd hate to make a trip into New York tonight. No, no, no tomorrow would be all right. I'll drop in at your office. I, I have the address. About 11 be all right? Yes, that'll be fine. Oh, here, I'll let you out. Oh, no, never mind. I can let myself out. Good evening, Mr. Redburn. Thanks. Good evening. You know who this is? Yeah, I know. Somebody was just here to see me. I believe the coccidiosis is about to wipe out my flock. Yeah? What about mine? Yours, too. I'm giving up the whole thing, and I suggest that you do the same. I'm going to follow the plan we made for just such an emergency. Yeah? When? Right now. As soon as I can... Oh. Oh. Pardon me for coming back in this way without knocking. I think I dropped that counterfeit bill I showed you. I didn't want to make you come back to the door. Oh, that's all right. But I think I remember seeing you put that bill back in your pocket. Oh? The uh, right coat pocket. Well, yeah, so I did. <laughs> Hope I didn't interrupt your phone conversation. No. I was just talking chickens with the neighbor. Talking to Mr. Flatton? No. Another neighbor. You know, Mr. Redfern, maybe I should tell you a little more about this case I'm working on, if you'd be interested. No, I would. Very interested. I've been working on the case for almost three years. No. Say, now, that shows you really have patience, you government men. This is a pretty clever gang. For a while, I just plugged along. Couldn't seem to get started. I just went along putting one piece of evidence with another. But now we're beginning to break the gang. Not too fast, but we're started. And pretty soon it's going to come apart. All of it. Good for you. Does a taxpayer good to hear of such efficiency? Thanks. You see, Mr. Radfern, we know that this gang operates in Philadelphia and Memphis and Boston. Boston? Really? Oh, I was just there today. Mm -hmm. I know. And you go to Philadelphia occasionally, and Memphis and Baltimore and Cleveland. Yes, yes. I do quite a lot of traveling. We don't have quite the key men to make a complete roundup at the present time, but if we could find one man... A man who could help us get this business washed up in a hurry. Uh -huh. I say if, if a man came along who could help us wipe the gang up in a hurry, he'd save the taxpayers quite a lot of money. Yes, I can imagine. He'd probably get off pretty easy himself, no matter how deep he's in with the gang. Well, of course, I can't answer for any of the gang, but that sounds pretty fair to me. But uh, I don't quite understand. If you have something on this man, why don't you arrest him, and then he might tell you what you want to know. We haven't quite enough evidence to arrest him. Not quite enough. But we will have soon. Well, this is very interesting, Mr. Stack, but I don't know what you want me to do about it. I'll just leave this card with you. If at any time, day or night, this man wants to help us and let us help him, have him call his number. No, no I'll keep the card in case I ever find anyone who needs it. Well, good evening, Mr. Radburn. Good evening, Mr. Stack. Elsie, Dorothy, where are you? Heavens, what's the matter with you, George Radford? He's been acting strange ever since I met him at the station. Oh, my two darling girls. I have the biggest surprise for you that you ever had. A nice surprise, George? What is this? The nicest surprise you can imagine. We're going on a vacation trip. Oh, Daddy! When? Now, immediately, this minute, you have to start packing right away. George, don't be so silly. We can't get of ready. Of course and... you can. What have you got to get ready? Throw a few clothes in the suitcase. But and... I'd want new things. Why, I don't even know where we're going. Uh, to the romantic parts of the world. You can buy pretty things as we go. Oh. Whatever you need, whenever you need them. George. Daddy, you don't mean it. Oh, I do mean it. We're driving to Baltimore to get our boat. Oh. We can make it if we're on our way in 20 minutes. Now, do we stand here talking or do you get going? Come on, Mother, before he changes his mind. I'll just like... throw a few things in a bag. It won't be long, and I don't want you two to waste any time either. No. <laughs> can't understand what's gotten into your father. But he's wonderful, isn't he? Oh, my, someone at the door right now while we're so busy. Uh, I think someone's at the door, dear. Yes, I hear it. I'll see who it is. I don't know what to think. 
Where are we going, Daddy? North or south? Oh, dear. Oh, by train? Oh, oh well, that now. What? Why, Officer Morris. How do you do, Mrs. Radford? Well, Mr. Radford's awfully busy at the moment, if you want to I just come to see about the ball team. The ball team? Stamford Police Force is getting up a kids' baseball team, Mrs. Radford, to play Greenwich and Darien and the other towns around here. That, that's awfully nice. Yes, uh, we think it'll do a lot of good. Keep the kids out of trouble and all that. Uh, we're taking up a collection, you know, to buy uniforms and kind of defray cuts. Well, we'd certainly like to contribute... Dear, my purse is upstairs, and we're in sort of a hurry. I could come back some other time. Oh, no, 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 you won't have to do that. Uh, Here's Mr. Radford's coat on the chair. I'll take it out of his wallet. And pay it back, of course. (laughs) Oh, yes, ma'am. That's what my wife always says. Let's see. How much are people giving? Oh, five, ten dollars. Well, we should be able to do as much. Here you are. A nice new ten dollar bill. Thank you, ma'am. We appreciate it. I know you're in a hurry, so I'll send you the receipt later. Fine, fine. Thank you. We are in a hurry. Good night, officer. Good night, ma'am. Who is that, dear? Officer Morris of the Stamford Police. Oh, really? Well, uh, Elsie, are you about ready? I'm coming. Uh, What did did he want, Officer Morris? Just a contribution for a boys' baseball team they're getting up. I gave him $10. Oh, is that all he wanted? That's fine. I had to give him the money out of your wallet, dear. My purse is upstairs, and we're in such a... You did what? I said I had... You out of my wallet? What, did I do something wrong? No, no, I guess not. But uh, we have to hurry. We have to get going. Why, darling, you do need a vacation. Look at your hand tremble. (laughs) It's going to be all right, my dear. Off to the seven seas, off to rest and relaxation. Elsie, hurry! Romance and adventure don't always wait. Is it, Mr. Stack? Counterfeit? Mm hmm. Yeah, it's hard to tell him, but this is one of the queer ones, all right. I didn't think he'd give any of these to you. Well, he didn't. It was Mrs. Radford. I can hardly believe it. He's such a, a quiet, easygoing fella. Kind of dull almost. Nice, though, real nice. Well, that's how it goes. Keep your eye on the car. He may sneak around from the back and come down the road to it. Let me watch him. I'll see him. Oh, look, they're coming out the front door. I see. I don't think he'll give us any trouble, but be careful. I never can tell. Well, say goodbye to the Burnham Grove. Our in the Burnham Grove. We won't see it for a while. But we'll be seeing a lot of other things that we'll like. Oh, Daddy, I kind of hate to leave it. Uh, we're off to the ports of adventure and romance. Oh, George. Oh, dear, now. No crying, Dorothy. Come on, we don't have time to waste on that. We need places to go and things to see. Here they come, sir. I'm ready for them. They won't get away. From Studio One at CBS, you have just heard Fletcher Marco's production of Laburnum Grove by J.B. Priestley. Another full-hour broadcast in Columbia's feature series of versions for listening of celebrated stories, novels, and plays. Tonight's script was prepared especially for this series by Charles Gussman, and the original musical score was composed and conducted by Alexander Semler. Now again, Mr. Marco. May a producer introduce the members of our cast tonight. In the Radfern family... George. ...was played by Everett Sloan. Elsie. ...was Anne Burr. Dorothy. ...was Miriam Wolfe. The Baxleys... Uncle Bernie. ...and Clara. ...were played by Lou Merrill and Grace Coppin. Harold... ...was Leon Janney. Mr. Stack... ...was Lamont Johnson. Louis Quinn was Joe Fletton. Hedley Rennie was Officer Morris. Inga Yollis was the telephone operator. And Brad Barker impersonated several of George Radfern's chickens. Next week, from Studio One at CBS... Our story is a melodrama, a most harrowing and suspenseful portrait of Paris during the French Revolution, where every man walked in fear of tomorrow and the long shadow of the guillotine reached across every face. It's called The Hunted, 
Written for Studio One by Margaret LeWorth and based on a play by Booth Tarkington. Please be with us. And now, until next week, until The Hunted, this is Fletcher Markle with a good night and thank you from all of us in Studio One. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.